Hey all, I wanted to check in with you guys, and more specifically, I wanted to talk a little bit about current events. Uh, I typically don't do that unless there's something really compelling, but I think now we have something really compelling, and it'd be kind of, uh, I think, uh, almost like educational malpractice for me not to, to weigh in here quickly for you guys. Uh, try to provide some insights that you may or may not find to be useful. Uh, I, I never want this course to be driven by current events. That, that's not the way to teach Introduction to American and Nevada Politics. It's just not. Uh, so, Congress, more specifically, the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, and we'll get to that topic right soon enough, but I would say sometimes we interchangeably use the terms Congress and the House of Reps. We really shouldn't. The House of Reps is the House of Reps. Congress is both the Senate and the House of Reps together, and then there's the Senate. Uh, it always helps uh, to be analytically precise with one's language. And I, I'm not always that way myself, but I, I aspire to it at least. So, right, the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, the Republican, I've heard it called caucus and conference. Uh, I don't know. I think old school, I prefer caucus. Anyway, the Republican caucus, right, which currently controls the House because they have the majority of membership, but by only, I think, four seats. And that's critical. So hold that in your mind for a minute. Republicans control the House by only, I think, four seats. It's a very slim majority indeed. And that's part, partly their problem right now. Right? And that's because they underperformed in the 2022 election cycle when just about all of us, certainly me, thought they were going to have a huge election cycle. Everything was lined up structurally for them to excel, and they didn't. <laughs> they didn't. They barely got the House back from the Democrats by the thinnest of margins. Uh, and and I, looking ahead to 2024, I severely doubt that they'll be able to hold it, uh, but uh, I'll come back to that in a little bit. All right, so, all right, they narrowly win the House, and that makes the Speaker's job, who essentially represents the majority party in the House, although we call them the Speaker of the House. They really speak for the majority conference, caucus, whatever you want to call it. All right, and so Kevin McCarthy was the obvious choice for that job, right? but there were about, you know, the number kind of moves around a little bit. Uh, we know now from the vote the other day that there's at least eight members that are hardcore MAGAs uh, that are, have kind of a burn-it-all-down approach, not interested in governing, not interested in policy, interested in chaos, anarchy, disruption, and fundraising, <laughs> and fundraising off of that MAGA energy in the base right now, right? Uh, they're not making irrational choices necessarily. For them, individually, it's rational to do what they're doing, blow it up. There's at least eight, um, perhaps as many as two dozen. Right, so that's a problem, isn't it? If, if there's even just eight, right, and they only have a four-seat majority, that's a problem. Right? That's a problem right there. Because unless McCarthy can hold together almost his entire conference, right, he can only afford to lose, I think, four, four votes. And, and he lost eight the other day. Right, and, and, and in order for him to get the speakership, Earlier, he had to agree to all sorts of concessions to the to the eight to twenty four or so uh, MAGA uh, members, right, including permitting a single member to call for the speaker's ouster, and then he had to hold the vote. So that's what happened, right? McCarthy worked with Democrats, God forbid. Now, look over in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, uh, Senate Minority Leader for the Republicans, Chuck Schumer, right, Senate Majority Leader for the Democrats. They worked together in bipartisan fashion because they're reasonably functional people. And the Senate, both Democratic and Republican, is still reasonably functional. And they got it done in terms of avoiding a, uh, a default on our debt and our, uh, our budgetary obligations by the federal government. They put together a bipartisan package. It went to the House. And ultimately, for McCarthy to push that through, he needed Democratic votes. All right, so that's what he did. Bipartisan, right? To the MAGA 8 to 24 members, right, that was unacceptable. Collaborating with the enemy, that's like treason. Uh, that's where we're at these days. That was treason, right? Unacceptable. So Matt Gates, attention-mongering uh, fool out of Florida, uh, called uh, for a vote, right? And McCarthy lost that vote. Eight members of the Republican Party defected. No Democrats voted to support McCarthy because they don't trust the guy. 
and for good reason. McCarthy had an impossible job, right? I think if he had come of age in a time when our politics were more normal, uh, I think he would have done very well as speaker. I think that's his that that's his sweet spot is uh, to be uh, a functional, bipartisan, hardworking member of Congress that gets things done and advances policy agendas, working with the other side, working with the president. But that's not the world that McCarthy lives in, right? He lives in a, 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 a polarized political environment where he's got to satisfy both the more mainstream Republicans and the more radicalized MAGA Republicans. Uh, and so he's trying to play both sides of the aisle, and he got caught out. You know, he got caught out. Uh, and so Democrats weren't going to support him. Normally you wouldn't expect that <laughs> for the opposition party to support you for speaker. Why would they do that? Um, so there was no, no appetite among Democrats to rescue McCarthy. And so his own caucus took him down. Right, eight defections is too many. So now they're without a speaker. There's an interim speaker. Turns out there's a really arcane rule in the House. Uh, very few people can keep up with this level of sort of in the weedsness of House rules. But a House rule is when you become Speaker, you, you, you list a number of names of people who would replace you if you were assassinated or incapacitated or in this case forced out, which has never happened in our entire history, by the way, of almost 250 years. This has never happened before. That's how bad our politics are right now, especially on the Republican side of the aisle. I, I'll be blunt. Uh, you know, re Republican establishment people will say the exact same thing. They'll be like, "Wow, Democrats look great compared to us. We're we're a, we're a mess right now. We're a, we're a clown show." Um, so this is not, I'm not advancing a radical claim here. <laughs> the dysfunction is almost exclusively on the Republican side of the aisle right now, partly because Trump kind of accelerated that tendency and sort of threw gasoline on the fire, beginning in 2016. He didn't, you know, he didn't start the fire. Uh, but he certainly accelerated it and, and made things more polarized. To his advantage, but perhaps not to the advantage of the American people or even the Republican Party. So, right, there's a, a rule in the House that when you become Speaker, you, you list a number of names of those who would replace you in extraordinary circumstances. Now, at the top of that list was one of his colleagues. I can't remember his name right now. He's interim Speaker. But he has no significant powers in that capacity as interim speaker. So he's just a placeholder until next week, when the Republican caucus is going to try to fix their situation and nominate and vote on the next speaker of the House. Right now, the inside track seems to be held by Jim Jordan out of Ohio, uh, who, who made his bones as a, as a, a, a Trump worshiper uh, and now is trying to convince his fellow Republicans that he's not just that. He's also mainstream. <laughs> he's, like, he's going to try to play, play the same game as, that McCarthy did. And as one Republican in the House put it, the guy out of South Dakota, I think, he said, look, this is a clown car, and if we don't fix the clown car and it's still a clown car, it doesn't matter who the driver is. You know, Kevin McCarthy, Steve Scalise, Jim Jordan, it's all about the same. It's a clown car. <laughs> so until we replace the clown car with a legit car, it's going to be super problematic. So that's what the House Republicans are going to try to do. You know? And then Trump, right, he, he said he was angry about this, although he didn't try to rescue McCarthy. <laughs> he said Republicans should be focusing their fire on Democrats, not fellow Republicans. This is the circular firing squad. But I'm like, dude, come on, man. And this, this fits his whole MO, right? Uh, he helped create this situation. Right? He pressured McCarthy to say and do crazy things uh, to be, you know, to show his loyalty to Trump and Trump's very large base, right? And so McCarthy was forced to, to the right and, and to semi-worship Trump in ways that alienated mainstream Republicans. So Trump helped create this situation with McCarthy. He didn't try to rescue him. And I don't know that he was really angry about this. He likes chaos and anarchy. He figures in, under conditions of chaos and anarchy, he can be a strong man who comes in and, 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 and rescues us in, in the context of chaos and anarchy. All right, he, he has, as I've suggested, he has no interest in institutional forms of governance. <laughs> that goes against his every instinct. Um, so, yeah, 
hard to see who gets next, albeit probably Jim Jordan, right, who Trump has endorsed. Uh, Steve Scalise, I think, would be a better choice. He's, he's a little less radical than Jordan. Uh, and I'm a pragmatist. I'll take a little bit a little bit less worse <laughs> over much worse. Jim Jordan. Uh, Scalise is a little less worse. Uh, but Jordan now probably gets it. Although, you know, mainstream Republicans are going to have a hard time supporting him. So we'll see. We'll see. For now, the House is shut down, not functioning at all. Right? Uh, say what you will about the Democratic Party, which has all the flaws that you'd expect, right? all the normal flaws of a, of a political party and a democracy. Right? Parties are flawed because we the people are flawed. And we the people are flawed because human nature is flawed. Right? So these things are inescapable, that we're going to have a deeply flawed politics. We just don't want a dysfunctional politics. There's a difference. Uh, Democrats have normal problems. Republicans right now have extraordinary problems. And I, I take no pleasure in that. I take no pleasure in that. It's bad for the Republican Party. It's bad for America. You know, democracies need at least two functioning uh, political parties. Right now, we basically have one, and then one that's pretty, pretty sick. That's not good. That's not good for the Republican Party. Not good for America. Uh, I, I hope uh, the GOP figures this out. Uh, my own sense right now is they're probably not going to figure it out in the short term. You know, they're going to limp along in their clown car until the November elections. And, and it seems to me not just likely, but highly likely that Democrats win back the House. It won't take that many extra seats to win it back. <laughs> they only need to pick up four or five seats. Uh, I think Democrats probably pick that right back up. And then they'll have a chance to, uh, to, to be the majority party. Uh, albeit, right, uh, their work in the last several uh, uh, House uh, sessions shows you that, yeah, at least Speaker Pelosi was able to hold that caucus together uh, consistently and therefore produce right, functionality and, and governance. I don't see any reason to think that's going to change. I don't think the Democratic Party right now has the same sort of unruly caucus that the Republicans have. And hey, look, a certain amount of conflict is normal, healthy, productive. You want that? You don't ever want to agree with each other all the time. That's kind of, that's not right. In a diverse, healthy democracy, there's disagreement and conflict. And out of that can come progress. And, but what we have now is a level of conflict that has become dysfunctional within the GOP caucus in the House. Again, you don't see that same dysfunction in the GOP in the Senate. Uh, so I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush here. But the problems here are severe for the Republicans in the House. They're severe. Um, yeah. All right. So that's kind of what's been happening, and, and that's kind of where we're at right now. All right, and there are some big things coming up that Congress needs to deal with, like avoiding uh, another default, which will come up again in about 40, 40 days or so. So they still haven't really fixed the budget, and we're still on the hook for defaulting on our obligations. Uh, and it's a little unclear how that's going to work out, given where the Republican caucus is right now because of that burn it all down group that doesn't give a fig about governing. <laughs> they want this function in chaos. They can raise money off of that and promote their own individual careers. Uh, it's just not good for the party and therefore not good for America. I've taken enough of your time. Thanks all. Take care.